you believe that he knows those plans and there's a wonderful life that he wants us to walk in a fullness of joy, of hope, of peace, right? There's a good life he has for us. But, but how many of you know that there are things externally that often rob us of that wonderful, right? How many of you know that there are things often internally that try to rob us of that wonderful, so what we're talking about in this series is we're, we're looking at and identifying some of those things, and we're talking about how we can lay those down instead of wandering and, and being in this place of, of, God, why is this happening, or why is that? We're, we're laying those down, and we're stepping into the wonderful that God has. Here's what we've been talking about. Week number one, just for review, we, we talked about laying down our feelings of inadequacy. These thoughts of, I'm not good enough, I'll never measure up, God could never love someone like me. We, we've been laying those down and embracing who God says that we are. That we are the, His masterpiece, we are the apple of His eye, we are His prized possession. That we're not who somebody else says that we are, we're not even the things that we often think of ourselves. We are, in fact, who God says that we are. Last week, we, we talked about a, a kind of a tough subject. We, we talked about laying down our need to control Weren't a lot of people here last week. That's probably because they knew that was coming. No, not really. <laughs> right? But, but here's what happens. When we try to control things, we think if I control them, if I handle this, then I can get it to go the way that I want it to go. But more often than not, at least I've experienced this in my life, when I try to control, the more I try to control, the more I lose control, and it just gets messy, right? So we're talking about laying down our need to control. Tonight, today, I, I want to talk to you about a big subject. In fact, as I said... I really think this is the most healing message of this series because we're going to talk about this, laying down our right to be offended. And I'm going to take your silence as your excitement to hear this, <laughs> right? We're going to talk about laying down our right to be offended because here's just the reality, okay? All of us wrestle, we struggle with being offended, Right? We struggle with, 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 with being so easily offended about so many things. In fact, I'll, I'll just be real honest with you, just be transparent, okay? Full disclosure. I find in my life this struggle. I often get so easily offended on little things. Can, can anyone relate to me? Th things that are like, really at the end of the day, very insignificant. Like, for example, driving causes me to be offended, especially when I'm driving in the North Hills, and I'm going down Seabert Road to get onto McKnight Road. Anybody ever been there? Little, si single-handedly, the worst intersection in the North Hills, right? I've been there trying to get into the flow of traffic, and I've, I've been going down Seabert before, and, 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 and I've seen people trying to get out of the parking lot by Starbucks, Right? How many of you have ever been in that scenario, right? You, you get stuck there, and it feels like an eternity because no one will let you in, right? And so because I'm such a benevolent, gracious, merciful, and loving follower of Jesus, that's a joke. <laughs> it's supposed to be funny, funny haha. -ha. Okay, anyway, I, I will many times allow people into the flow of traffic. But, but, but here's, here's how this works for me. When I do that, I have some expectations of those individuals. In fact, I probably should put like a sign on my car. This is what I expect of you if I let you out. But, but here's, here's kind of how it works in my mind. Here's my expectations. Number one, I expect if I allow someone out into the flow of traffic for them to move quickly... Because there is nothing worse in my mind than you getting out in front of me, running through this light, light, light slowly. You get the green light, but because you went so slow, I get the red light. That's just not right if I let you out. Big problem for me. The, the second one is, is this. I, I just have this expectation that if I'm going to let you in front of me, that there should be some acknowledgement of my generosity. That there should just be something that says, you just hooked me up, right? It doesn't have to be big. It, it could just be a little head nod. You could flash your lights at me. You could do a little courtesy wave, like, thank you. J just something that says, if you had not let me out, I would have been there for 35 years, right? The, just something. Now, now here's, 
getting back to the offense. Here's what happens when those expectations are not met. I get offended. I get so offended, and this is, maybe you won't come to church next week after you find out how weird I am, but I get so offended, I will actually try to memorize that license plate. I have this little thing in the, in the console of my car called F Field Notes. It's a, a, a little notebook. I will write down the make and the model of that car so that if I ever see them coming out of that parking lot again, I refuse to let you in because you did not give me the courtesy wave. Can, can anyone <laughs> relate to my weirdness? For those of you that can't, you just sit back and polish your halos. Okay? Because I'm going to talk to some real people today. Here's just the reality. All of us struggle with offenses. And it doesn't have to be big things. Right? It, it could be something small. Like, like maybe somebody has a little bit of an attitude with you. Right? They catch a little bit of a tone with you, right? And, and you get offended. Or, or maybe you send a text message to somebody and they don't respond to you right away. And you know that they got it because it says delivered. And you know that they read it because it says read. I mean, you're like, at least like, put something in the space that gives me the little dot, dot, dot that let me know you're thinking about it. Don't just ignore me for two and a half hours. Right? I mean, you can get offended. Maybe not. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> me and Jaron. Okay. M m maybe somebody legitimately does something that is wrong. And they don't say they're sorry. Maybe it's not a big deal, but they don't say they're sorry. We can get offended, right? How about this? It actually can happen in the church world. I know, that's so shocking. But it can happen. Well, I came to church today, and I wanted to hear the song that is my favorite song. Because after all, I came to get my spiritual tiggly wiggly on. Right? Or I can't believe they said that, or I can't believe they used that version of the Bible. I, I, I get so offended. The reality is, all of us in one way, shape, or another, struggle with being offended. The question becomes, why? What, why are we so easily offended? And I think one answer, at least, could be this. Because too often, we're living out of our ego. Right? Our, our ego wants to be right. Right? Our ego wants to win. Our, our ego wants it to be all about us, right? We want what we want. But, but here's where the tension comes in when we talk about offenses. In order for us to be right, somebody else has to be wrong, right? In order for us to win, somebody else has to lose. And in order for it to be just the way that I want it to be, it can't be the way somebody else wants it to be. And so there's this struggle that we can become offended because our, we're, we're living out of our ego. So what does the Bible actually have to say to us about that? It's very interesting when you, you look at Scripture. There's so much to be said about offenses. One such verse, if you have your Bibles or you're following along you version live, Proverbs chapter 19 in verse 11, Scripture says this. Solomon writes, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Now, let me kind of break this down for you because I think we, we have to understand at least at face value here. When, when, when Solomon writes, It's to our glory to overlook an offense, he is not saying overlooking an offense means to pretend like it never happened. You understand what I'm saying? It's not to live in this little la-la world of, of, of this never happened or this never took place or this person never did that. Okay, that, that's not what he's meaning. What he's meaning is this. It, he says it's to our glory to overlook, or you could say it this way, to actually practice forgiveness. It's to our glory to pass over an offense. It's to our glory to catch some spiritual altitude, to get a different perspective. It's to our glory to say, I could stay here angry, upset, bitter, resentful, 
looking for opportunities to find my revenge. But I'm choosing, rather than doing that, I'm choosing to practice forgiveness. Because I myself have been forgiven. Right? This is what he says. It's to our glory to overlook an offense. Which leads to the question then, how do we do that? That's what all of you were asking. You didn't know that you were asking that, but that's what I heard. Right? How, if it's to my glory to overlook an offense, how do I do that? And, and I would argue that the simple answer is this. We stop living out of our ego, and we start living out of the grace that God has extended to us. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about this. In Romans chapter 12, he writes these words. He says, for by the grace given me. Now, now let's pause here for a second, and, and let's put this into context. Did Paul ever in his life receive any grace from God? Yeah. Right? He, he, he was once Saul, and as Saul, he was a persecutor of the church. Anybody that professed faith in Jesus Christ, he would imprison, he would, he, he would martyr, he would kill them, he would do whatever it took. He wanted to wipe out the message of Jesus until one day he has an experience with the risen Christ, on the road to Damascus, Jesus literally appears to him, says, Paul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It so dramatically transforms his life that he goes from being so passionate about trying to wipe out the name of Jesus that he becomes the single most effective person on planet Earth to spread the gospel around the world, wrote over half of the New Testament because God extended some grace to him. Which brings me to a second question. Has God ever extended any grace to you? Yeah. Which takes it a little bit deeper and says this. Have you ever had a moment? Have you ever had a need? Have you ever had a time where you hoped that in response to something that you had done, somebody would give you grace instead of maybe what you deserved? Th this is what Paul is talking about here. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Here's a loose translation of this. Essentially, he's saying, if we have received grace on a regular basis, because we have received that, because we desire that, because we need that, if we're going to continue to receive grace, we should be willing to extend that same grace to others. As Scripture says elsewhere, and you can apply this verse many different ways, but Scripture says this, freely you have received, therefore, freely you should give. And so let, let's do this for the remainder of our time. Let, let's talk about some very tangible, very practical ways that we can extend grace, we can extend forgiveness to others based on the grace that we ourselves have received from God. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, I would say this. Here's what we're going to do. In response to God's grace, we will give others the benefit of the doubt. We're going to give others the benefit of the doubt. Let, let me read you a verse. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul writes again. He says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Help me out with this statement. Would you say it with me? Making allowances for each other's faults. We could just pause there for a second. That's pretty good. Making allowances for each other's faults. He goes on to say, because of your love. Now, now here, here's a big question. How often do we do that? If we're honest, we'd have to say probably not often enough right? More often than not, here's our response. We have a tendency to judge people based on their actions, but we judge ourselves based on our intentions, right? We say, well, I'm, I'm judging you because you did this, or you behaved that way, or you reacted like this, or you said that, but then when we ourselves have a bad day or when we ourselves do something, we say, oh, but, but, but you need to understand, I didn't have my coffee yet. 
Or, or I'm, I'm, just a, I'm, I'm just too tired or whatever the case might be, right? We, we have a tendency to judge others based on their actions, but ourselves on our attentions. But what, what does Scripture teach us to do? We, we see very clearly from this text that what we should do is because God has extended grace and forgiveness to us, we should give others the benefit of the doubt. What, what might that look like? Well, let's go back to our scenario. Maybe somebody is short with you, has a little bit of a tood. You know what I mean? Attitude, little tone in their voice. We could get upset or we could say, maybe there's something going on in their life. Maybe they had a bad day, like today for me. I was trying to get out of the house. I have a timetable in which I need to get to church. And everybody in my house knows if we are a half an hour early, we are an hour late. Amen. And I can't understand. I'm like, my 17-year-old, listen, it should not take you an hour and a half to put your face on. Like, let's go. Dad needs coffee, and dad needs to get to church, or this is not going to be a good day. And so I yelled at her the whole way to church, and I had to apologize before the first service because I was having a bad day. Okay. Maybe we could extend the benefit of the doubt. Maybe somebody cuts us off in traffic. We could get upset about that, or we could say, it's really not that big of a deal. Maybe they're in a hurry. Maybe they're late for something. Maybe there's an emergency, right? Maybe they need to get somewhere sooner, quicker than I need to get wherever I'm going. We, we could give others the benefit of the doubt. I toyed with doing this, and I did it in the first service, so I feel like I'm obligated to do it in the second service. Let me just say this to all of you men. PMS is not about you. Until you ask, and then it is all about you. You know, I, I live in a sorority, right? And so he, he, here, here's what I'm learning. Here, here's what I'm learning. The 11th commandment should be this. Thou shalt not ask, is it your time of the month? J just shouldn't happen. And those of you that are offended that I brought that up in church, it is to your glory to overlook the offense of your pastor. <laughs> all, all joking aside, though, <laughs> I'm going to hear about that one when I get home. All, all joking aside, here's really the goal we should shoot for as followers of Jesus. We should strive to have thick skin and a soft heart. We should, we should strive to have thick skin. We're not offended about everything. We're not upset about everything. Not everything gets us all off kilter, right? We, we, we want to have thick skin, but we want to have a soft heart. Why? Why? Why is it important that we still maintain a soft heart? Because here's just the reality, whether you know this or not, it is true. Hurt people hurt people. People who are hurting are defensive. People who are hurting are wounded. People who are hurting don't always have the best reactions. But when we understand that maybe their response to us or, or maybe their actions toward us is because they're hurting... That could fill us with compassion, and rather than adding insult to injury, we could say, I'm going to pray for them, or I'm going to try to help them, or I'm going to do what I can to, to, to just support them and show them some compassion. As followers of Jesus, because of the grace God has extended to us, we're going to give others the benefit of the doubt. Now, number two, if you're taking notes, here's a big one. Because the grace God has given us, Here's what I would say the second thing we should do. We will not label people. It's a great place to say amen. We're not going to label people. Let, let, let me kind of break this down for you. Think about it like this. Think about if God labeled us based on things that we did. Right? Th think about it. Think about if God took one or two moments in your life, one or two incidences in your life, and, and he had this big rubber stamp, and it just based on that, he just, you are forever labeled this. I'm just going to tell you right now, and, and we can take like a 30-second praise break if you feel like you need to, I am thankful. I am beyond grateful 
that God does not label me based on the things that I do. Can anyone just say amen to that? I'm so grateful. But, but here again is where the tension is. Because while we know and we believe and we love that God doesn't label us, we have a tendency in our lives to take one or two moments and label people based on those moments. Well, he did that. He's a jerk. It's just who he is. Or she did that. She, she's a you-know-what. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Or they're this or they're that, right? But, but, but here, here's, here's the thing. What are, what are we actually doing when we label people? Think about this. We're permanently labeling somebody based on a temporary moment. I would argue as followers of Jesus, because God does not do that to us, we should not do that to others. In fact, Jesus talked about this. Here, here's what Jesus says that we should do. L Luke chapter 6 Verses 36 and 37, very powerful. Jesus says, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. What, what do we do in response to God's grace? We give others the benefit of the doubt, right? We... we, we Refuse to label people. But this is where the rubber meets the road. Let me give you the third thought. And it's simply this. Based on God's grace extended to us, we will forgive as we have been forgiven. It's going to get a little quiet in here. I'm just going to warn you. But let me read you a verse, and we're going to unpack this a little bit. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul goes on to say this. Make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, now here's just kind of practically speaking how this works. We can sit here and go, okay, Chris, I get it. I get it. I, I should give others the benefit of the doubt because I certainly need the benefit of the doubt. Cool. I, I, I should not label people because I don't like to be labeled. Got it. I, I should let the little things go. Like somebody cuts me off in traffic, it's really not that big of a deal. Somebody does something that's, that's small, minute, but it's wrong, and they don't say they're sorry, I, I can let that go. But, but you're not telling me, Chris, you're not about to tell me that I need to let the big things go. Right? You're not going to tell me that I need to forgive someone that's abused me. You're not going to tell me I need to forgive someone that's betrayed me. You're not going to tell me I need to forgive somebody who's lied about me, who's, who's cheated me, who, who's done all manner of evil against me. I mean, God, God has to understand. God, God, God has to be on my side on this one, Chris. Like, he has to get that I want to seek some sort of revenge because of the big thing. Like, you, you're not going to tell me that I need to forgive those things. Let me read you a verse that I find very, very sobering. It's Jesus speaking again. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. He says this. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, there, there's a lot of points in Scripture that I love the but God verses. This one is not my favorite. But, he says, if you don't forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you and, and just be honest with you. I don't like this verse. This is the verse that, for, for many, many years, 
I just prayed that God would just miraculously omit it from my version of the Bible. In, in fact, in, in response to things that have happened in my life, we, we had, without going into great detail, we had a family member in our family that abused several people in our family. And I remember as I was grappling with the pain of that, as I was wrestling with that struggle, and I came across this verse. For years, I refused to read it. For years, I'd read through Matthew chapter 6, and, and when we got to this verse, I'd just jump over and pick up with the, with the rest of it, right? Because here, here's the struggle I had. God, how can I forgive someone who's hurt me like this? How, how can I forgive someone that's hurt people that I love? How, how can I forgive someone who by all intents and purposes, by human standards, has done something that is totally and completely unforgivable? How, how, how can you ask me? Is it even, like, I don't like this. Can, can I just be that level of transparent with you? I, this isn't cool with me. How in the world can you expect me to do this? How is it even possible? And as I was wrestling with this, not like Jacob wrestled with God in the Old Testament, you know how he wrestled with the angel and then the angel hit his socket and he limped. If you think I'm limping today, it's not because I wrestled with God, it's actually because I did legs yesterday and my legs are on fire right now. Because <laughs> the second day is always worse than the first day. Who invented lunges? Oh, anyway, I digress. <laughs> as, as, as I wrestled with God, I felt like God bring me to this verse. And I, I love, in, in one sense, how Scripture correlates with other Scripture. But here's what God brought me to. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. God, how, how can I do this? God says to us, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. How is it possible that we extend forgiveness to others who have done the big things? How is it possible that we forgive people who've betrayed us, people who've lied about us, people who've hurt us? God says it's possible by forgiving as we have been forgiven. By forgiving in light of the forgiveness we ourselves have received. Now, now listen, I'm, I'm not about to sit here and tell you this is easy. I'm also not sitting here saying, whatever hurt you have, just get over it. Please, please do not misinterpret what I have to say. By no means am I diminishing the severity and the reality of the hurt that you feel. I know what it's like to hurt. I know what it's like to experience deep pain. But what I have discovered, and I'm continuing to discover, is that if we will allow God to, if we will give Him access, God has this very unique ability to transform the way that we think. He has this ability to come in to heal our hearts, to restore the, those, those wounded areas of our life, to, to bring us to a place where we don't respond the way that we would want to respond, we respond the way that He responds, that He could fill us supernaturally with His grace and with His love and with His compassion. In fact, what, what, what I found in my life is the, the more I press into God, the more I lean into Him, especially you know how emotions are, they're, they're kind of like waves, right? Some days you're having good days, other days you just can't even cope, the pain is too deep, it's too real. But as I press into God, as I, as I offload that herd, as I do life with God and understand that He is a good, good Father, that He is a loving God, that He is an ever-present help in time of trouble, that He is my strength when I am weak, that he is my peace when there shouldn't be any. That he alone can give me hope and joy in the midst of all kinds of chaos. Come on, somebody. 
It says, I press into him and I allow him to have his way. I allow him to change the way I think. I allow him to heal my heart that I'm actually able to forgive in real time. I'll give you an example. Some, some time ago, many years ago now, Carrie and I had some friends that, that somewhere along the way, at least initially, we hurt them in some way, and we didn't know what happened. And, and they were so hurt by whatever we said, whatever we did at the time, we know what it is now, but th th they basically, for lack of a better way of saying it, they kind of turned on us, kind of talked about us, they said some things, kind of attempted by what they were saying, it could have been like a destroying of our character, of our integrity, and, and, and listen, you got to understand, like being a pastor, that, that's kind of some of what you deal with. People take things out of context. People say, oh, Pastor Chris said that when he was preaching. I didn't say it. You might have heard it, but I don't know what voices you're listening to because I didn't, you know, anyway. Right? Or, or people will say, I talked to Pastor Chris and he said, or whatever the case might be, you can use my name, whatever, right? So, so some of that is, is kind of par for the course. It's not easy, but you kind of get used to it. Th this was beyond that. Th this was stuff that the way they were saying things and what they were saying were, what was potentially or could potentially destroy relationships that we had with other people. The, the, the things that they were saying could, could potentially cause people to question our character, our integrity. And in case you don't know anything about me, I don't do everything right, admittedly. But I'm pretty passionate about being a man of integrity. I'm pretty passionate about my character because at the end of the day, that's all I have is my name. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to let you down. That doesn't mean I'm not going to fail you, but I'm going to try to do the best I can to be a man of integrity. And, and so this was big. And, and I'm just going to be real honest with you and tell you, my knee-jerk reaction, <laughs> my, my, my natural reaction was, let's deal with it. Right? It, it was like, I'm going to get all of my evidence all of you sitting back there like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, you do. I'm going to screenshot all the text messages. I'm going to get all this little stuff together so that I can prove who, to whoever that, that you're not telling me the truth and I am. I'm, I'm going to try to figure out who you've been talking to. And, and I'm going to go and I'm going to defend myself to them, right? I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to handle it, right? I'm going to try to work this thing out. But, but for whatever reason, as Carrie and I talked about it, we felt like God say, let me handle it. That was hard. But we just felt like God say, I'll be your defender. I know the truth. I also know that you're not perfect, so you probably did something to cause this offense, but let me handle it. And we just felt like God say, here's all I want you to do. I just want you to give it to me and pray for them. Just want you to pray for them. <laughs> and so here's kind of what happened. I feel like I need to sit down for a second. I don't know what camera's on me, but I'm over here. <laughs> Sometimes I walk out of the frame. But, but, but I remember as, as the days and the weeks and the months went by as we were processing through this, you know, I'd have good days. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you kind of, you're okay. Okay, I got this. It's no big deal. God's got this, right? And then I'd be sitting at my desk, and I'd be working on my sermon, you know, very spiritual moment. Oh, glory to God. I'm typing away. Holy Spirit is speaking to me. This is going to be the best sermon I've ever preached in my entire life. And I'm, I'm just typing away, you know what I mean? And then, like, this thought will come to my mind about them or something that I heard them say. And I'm just, I'm just, just typing away, and then I, I pause, and I look at my screen. I'm like, oh, yeah, that probably shouldn't be in my sermon. <laughs> those words need to be deleted. You know what I mean? Like, it just kind of comes out of you. You're tracking with me. And I just felt like God said to me personally that every time I feel that hurt, to not carry it on my own and to just press in and give it to Him. Every time it hurts, offload it to God. Every time I have a thought about it, Give it to him. 
Every time I'm, I'm, I got the phone in my hand and I'm dialing their number to just, you know, give them what for, hang up the phone and call Jesus. That's really good right there. You should have said amen. <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> but, but here's what happened. As I was doing that, and I'm not saying I was great every time, but as I did that, the more I pressed in, the more I relinquished, the more I allowed God to do his work in my life. Supernaturally, he enabled me to get some spiritual altitude, to get some perspective. And as he allowed me to overlook the offense, he filled my heart, he filled our heart with compassion to the point that not only were we able to forgive in real time as the offenses continued to happen, but we were actually able to stop praying, God, get them. Expose them, Lord. And we started, we were actually able to pray, God, restore this relationship. Heal our hearts, heal their hearts. Help us to be able to work this thing out. Now, I'll tell you, the end of the story is it took several years. But I'm happy to tell you, I didn't tell people this at the Saturday service, and everybody came up to me afterwards like, what happened, what happened? And I, I failed to tell them. So let me tell you, God worked it out. It took some time, but things are back in good shape now. But what it taught me was this. It was only through the power of Jesus. It was only by his grace. It was only by his strength. It was only with his help that I was able to overlook the offense. So see, here's what I want you to understand. Just as much as we all would agree that hurt people hurt people, forgiven people forgive because we ourselves have been forgiven. Now, let's, let's break that down a little bit because I'm only three minutes over, so I got like 20 more minutes to preach. <laughs> but, but, but I want you to think about this. In the Old Testament, how was forgiveness provided? We know that according to the Jewish law, that, that you had to earn your forgiveness. On the Day of Atonement, you would bring a pure and spotless animal and you would sacrifice that before the Lord, right? And through that bloodshed of that animal, you would have the purchasing of your forgiveness. But, but really, it wasn't the removal of your sins. It was really the covering of your sin, right? Because it was something that you had to do year in and year out, every year, right? But we, we even know that, that when the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt, that God came to Moses and said, I'm going to deliver my people. I'm going to send the death angel to Egypt. He's going to wipe out all the firstborn of every family that doesn't have the blood of the lamb over their house. And so he said to Moses, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to take an innocent lamb, have every family sacrifice an innocent, pure, and spotless lamb. And take the blood of that lamb and put it on the top of the doorpost. And put it on the sides of the doorpost. And when I see the blood... I will pass over a beautiful picture of the grace of God. But hidden within this is something even more profound. Because what we see is as you put blood on the top of the doorpost, some of it's going to run down the door. As you put it on either side of the doors, doorpost, some of it's going to swipe over. And there you see, even in the Old Testament, this New Testament foreshadowing of the cross of Jesus, because here's what I came to tell you today. It is by the grace of God that you are forgiven. It is not because of anything that you have done. It is not based on anything that you can do. It's not you being good enough and you not doing too many bad things. It is by Christ and Christ alone. Jesus became the pure and sinless Lamb of God for you and for me. He shed his blood on the cross that purchased us back. The Bible says that all of us deserve death. All of us deserve punishment. All of us deserved hell. But because of God's grace, because of his mercy, because of his love extended to us long before we ever deserved it, we have been bought back 
We have been redeemed. We have been made whole. And I, I don't know how the, how the scenario plays out in your mind, and I guess when we get to heaven, we'll have to ask Jesus if this is how it took place. But I imagine God looking down at mankind going, Jesus, something has to be done. I love these people too much. I can't just let them be lost. I can't just let them be broken. I, just, I, I can't just let this stuff go on. We, we need to do something. And I imagine Jesus going, ooh. Right here. I'll do it. But son, you don't understand. You're going to have to die. I know. It's going to hurt. Yeah, I get it. Your heart is going to be broken because even while you hang on that cross, they're going to curse you. They're going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you. It's okay. I'm willing to give my life for them all. That my friends, is the grace that we have received. In fact, Scripture goes on to say this, that anyone, just pause at that word, anyone. I think the King James says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, calls upon the name of Jesus, will be saved. Don't ever forget the reality that as you place your faith in Jesus Christ, nothing you have done to earn it, nothing you have done to achieve it, not you being good enough, everything that Jesus did on your behalf as you place your faith in Jesus, Jesus washed away your sins. Past, present, and future. All of your guilt all of your shame, all of your regret, all of your remorse, all of those things that, that if you could do them over again, you wouldn't do them over again. You know what I'm talking about? All of that is handled. All of that is dead. It is buried. It is gone. It is over. It's as if it never even happened because of God's grace extended to you. And all God asks is this, in light of that reality, to live your life for me. And when you experience offenses, and you will, when you experience hurt, and you will, when people do things that they shouldn't do to you, which they will, rather than holding on to an offense, you forgive as you have been forgiven. I like the way that Lewis Smeads puts it. He says, forgiveness is setting a prisoner free and discovering that the prisoner was you. See, so often we think about the context of forgiving and what, but really forgiveness sets you free from the weight of the offense. So here's what I believe God wants to have happen here today. Through His might and through His power, by His strength, He wants to begin the process of helping us to let go of the offense to let go of the hurt and to experience his grace and his mercy and his strength and his help. Some of you, truth be told, there are big things that have happened in your life. I get it. I get it. But I believe you don't have to be a prisoner to that anymore. That you can be free some of you, there's a bunch of little things that have, have so compiled in your life that now it's become a big thing. God wants to help you to overcome those offenses.
Jesus. Some of you, the person that you have held this against isn't even around anymore. But you know you can still forgive? Here's the big one, though. Maybe some of you, the reality is, as the Holy Spirit speaking to you, maybe, maybe you're the offender. And it's time that you go and you make things right. You know what Jesus said? Very interesting. Je Je Jesus said, if you come to church, I'm going to paraphrase. If you come to church and they're singing your favorite song, and the preacher is like just like preaching the best sermon ever. And as you're sitting there and you, you realize that there's some sort of offense that you have created towards somebody else, leave church. Now that is not church growth 101, but I'm just telling you. Leave church. Go make things right and then come back. That's the importance of forgiveness. Now, let, let me say one more thing. Trust has to be earned. We, we all understand that? Trust has to be earned. But forgiveness is required because forgiveness sets us free. So let's bow our hearts and our heads together today. Father, we recognize that subjects like this are not easy. God, we recognize that in all reality, we've been in both areas. We've been the offended and we've been the offender. God, the reality of those hurts weighs so heavy on our hearts. Many times, God, they really hinder us from being able to fully experience the wonderful that you have for us. And we recognize that your word is life, and we recognize that your word is truth, and we recognize that your word guides us and directs us in our life. And well, we're not even acknowledging that it's easy, but we do recognize that it's right. And so we're asking for your help this morning. God, help us to forgive. Help us, God, to press into you, to, to, to give that hurt to you. God, the comfort I take in that is knowing that you are the great healer. That there's no heart that is too broken, there's no life that is in too much despair, that you cannot heal, that you, you cannot restore. In fact, you tell us in your word, come unto me, all you who are weary and brokenhearted, and I will give you rest. God, we need that rest. But we know, Lord, it's impossible to do on our own, so we ask for your help today. Father, we also pray, though, that as we take inventory and as we allow your spirit to continue to speak to us even beyond today, Lord, for those people in our lives that we have offended, we, we ask that you would help us to take the necessary steps to restore the brokenness of those relationships. God, we even ask that you would just go before us as you promised that you do and just prepare their heart. And Lord, let healing and peace and unity and newness come. God, I'm so thankful that we don't have to do these things alone because you're the God who says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, never will I turn my back on you. I am always with you. So God, we just cast our cares upon you today. And we thank you in advance, God, for the work that you are going to do in our hearts, in our lives. As you help us on a regular basis to live in light of the grace that you have given us. Lord, because of your grace, with your help, we're going to give the benefit of the doubt. Because of your grace, with your help,
we're not going to leave. Because of your grace, with your help, we're going to forgive you as we have been forgiven. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us today. We thank you that you love us so much that you made it possible for us to know what love is, to know what forgiveness is. Lord, I pray for those in this room today that maybe as they they look at their lives, they, they recognize that they have never fully put their faith in you. They recognize that they, they, they've never really experienced your forgiveness and they're carrying the guilt and the shame and the regrets of life. But maybe today they're, they're realizing that they can call upon you, they can believe and receive they can confess you and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will receive your forgiveness. So Lord, I pray for those in this room that just right now with their own confession is just saying, Jesus, I recognize my need of you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for making me new. I ask you to help me to live for you. Lord, as you pray a simple prayer like that, we know that the past is erased, our sins are forgiven. ask God that you would help us to take the hope of Jesus with us into every sphere of our influence and help the world to see and know that we are your followers by our love. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us at Church Online today. If you'd like to learn more about us, visit our website at ridgewood.church. And if you'd like to watch more sermons, you can visit our YouTube channel as well. If you'd like to share your story and you felt like God really touched your life during this teaching, we'd love to hear about it. So let us know at amen at ridgewoodlife.org. And we'd love to hear about it and just you share with us how God has impacted you today. All right, guys, have a great day.